Yeah. He's my friend. Oh, yeah. We work in the media together. I know, He's the I've been the for, radio. Yeah, so. I've known him for 11 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, his family is really a household name in Dubai. Uh -huh. You see your world is small. Yeah. But you have the same friend. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Ivan is a really good man. Yeah. He's yeah. a cool guy. Yeah. Very successful. Uh, yeah. Um, he, I think he employs over 5,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. He's, a, he's really a good man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 So, He's gotten us out of a lot of problems. Always, always good at solving problems. Yeah. Yes, he is. Uh, so, uh, I mean, trouble to come out of doing that. I can plan it. Yes. I can plan it. I can plan to be in Kabai. I have not been in Kabai in two years. Can you imagine? And that's my home area. Yeah. So because, Your family still there? No, no, my family is in, in Tunga. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, the, so some of the, the, the relatives who are still there, because of the phone, I don't travel there easily in yeah. two years. I haven't yeah. been there in two years. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe I could, I could plan. We're, we're staying at uh, Bunyoni Overland, Overland Resort. For four nights, wow. four nights were there. Wow. So uh, you see, when you are at the new overland, across, yeah. across is my county. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. it's a stone throw. Uh -huh. I think we, that's is that where they had the wedding last time. We were sitting. They had two days wedding, right? Party. Well, they always have parties there. Yeah, across across that overland is my sub county. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, well, we'll give you the we'll give you the information and then you can meet up with us if, yes, you, if you have the yes please give, yeah. uh, let me know so so I see whether I can show you some notes some places yeah maybe you have not gone to you never know <laughs> I'm sure I haven't gone to yeah yeah okay nice. let me meeting you nice yeah. you yeah. <laughs> Hello, it's long time I'm seeing. How are you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think like, yeah. a lot of countries can do the yeah. things like China did. Because, Especially uh, when you think about the time we're going to solve it. You have no idea where you are. Yeah. 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 It is nature is really yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Some local officials, yeah. 
Thank you. Welcome those that were in the room here at the uh, Walter Cronkite School at Arizona State University here in beautiful downtown Phoenix. We've got a wonderful crowd starting to gather to hear the final in our series of uh, Cronkite Global Conversations uh, this year from our Hubert H. Humphrey Fellows. And delighted to have faculty and global friends and old friends and new students who have all come to uh, hear today's conversation. Because I know the material is going to be rich and full, and even though there's only two of them, I'm going to jump right to the chase and uh, introduce our topic today, Reconciliation in the Balkans. I've been blessed to be to that part of the world probably close to 20 times since 1999. I probably know that part of the world better than any other part other than the United States. I still do not understand. <laughs> I'm very much a student of learning when it comes to the Balkans, and there's nobody better to teach us than Nara Valencic and Radovan, we all know him as Gigo Bogojevic. Probably all of all right, they'll correct my bad pronunciation. <laughs> but I did get Alma Tilipachinovich. That only took me five years. Um, so, so we're delighted to have them both. We will take questions at the end. Um, and so let's welcome who's up first, you or both together. It's a tag team. So welcome also. I mean, my name, I mean, Nell's name. So we're going to start this. Yeah. I know that some of you are. This is where Nara had lived, so she's really good at this. There we go. Yep, we're good. Yep. So some of you are experts on the Balkans, like Dr. Bill. Some of you don't know that much. We'll try to make this so everyone can try to understand in these 40 minutes what is it all about. And I'll start like with one small comparison. Some of you probably know what is this. This is uh, uh, the Dragon Queen uh, Daenerys completely unnecessarily destroying the city of Dubrovnik, which has the name of King's Landing in this uh, TV show, and killing its good people. And people were shocked when they saw this. This is uh, 30, year, 30 years before that. This was Montenegrins uh, completely unnecessarily destroying uh, the city of Dubrovnik and, and the people in it. And when this uh, scene from the TV show appeared, like internet was full of jokes and memes, kind of like Montenegro did it before, but yeah, uh, in, like in the beginning of the 90s and not even now, it, it wasn't funny. This was part of a really, really bloody war, uh, a civil war that happened in a uh, country that, that we are born in and that doesn't exist anymore. And you may now really ask why this all matters and why the Balkans matters. Like our country is at best, our former country is at best 20 million people. Like 20 million people is statistically nothing. And they cannot have that much influence on the world. And I will ask you, not the experts, but uh, <laughs> do you know who is this? Princip. Yeah, this is uh, Gavrilo Princip. He was a Serbian nationalist who killed uh, also, Hungarian uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and started uh, what then was called the Great War, what we know now as uh, the World War One, the bloodiest war uh, at that moment in the uh, in the world's history. 
And it all started in the Balkans because we couldn't agree what is our territories, what is uh, territories that they occupy. Uh, we kind of wanted this territory to be uh, free from the Austro-Hungarian occupation, and uh, this happened. And that kind of repeating uh, thing in the Balkans, this is a quote from uh, Winston Churchill, who said famously the Balkans produced more history than uh, it can consume. He knows because he needed to involve his country because of the things that happened in the Balkans. And this is uh, uh, a comic caricature uh, from the beginning and from the, yeah, from, this is from the beginning of 20th century, this is from the beginning of the 21st century. And this is showing the whole Europe uh, trying to suppress the Balkan troubles. This is showing uh, the Balkans between European Union, let me this, European Union and Russia, always trying to uh, like exert dominance. So it's kind of not always our fault. We always has been a place where the great powers try to play their game and uh, to be dominant. And two things that Balkan gave you to find, and you maybe know, you probably know. One is Nikola Tesla, uh, one of the most <laughs> famous uh, inventor and scientists in terms of electricity. And the second thing is ethnic cleansing. So I don't claim that Balkans invented ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing uh, existed. We gave it the name because this name was not used until we started to ethnically cleanse uh, some of our countries. And it's funny, like, Nikola Tesla is the like, most positive example we can give, but if you ask anyone in the Balkans, this could be a huge problem, because both Croatians and Serbs claim that uh, Nikola Tesla is uh, one of them. <laughs> so complicated, he was born on a Croatian territory that was at that time part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was, his father was a Serbian priest, and now you still have, uh, you still can hear uh, examples of people uh, uh, having arguments and then beat each other in a bar over is Tesla, um, uh, is Tesla Serbian or, or, or Croatian. And we have one really, one, let's say, uh, funny guy, he's not that funny, uh, he wrote a book, uh, Tesla was Montenegrin, uh, so we also try to claim him. <laughs> yeah, a book. And just to jump, uh, we need to explain you first the, you know, the, this war so, uh, so we can explain the, uh, the whole reconciliation things because you need to know what happened so people need to reconcile now. This is, uh, this, is you, this is the problem. So this is the ethnic map of people uh, just before the war, the war started. And see, this is Croatia and this is Bosnia and this blue are Serbs. So there was a lot of Serbs in Croatia and in Bosnia. And Bosnia, for example, has what we think in the 90s is a beautiful thing, and I still think it's a beautiful thing, has like three religions living together. But just one year later, that became the all hell broke loose because of that. And uh, people started to go into war. You saw wars are so not one thing that's like series of wars, it's like Slovenia war that lasted only for 10 days, likely with like minimal casualties, Croatian war for independence, Bosnia wars that was at one point uh, what they call in video games free for all, which is really rarely happens in the war, you usually have two sides, at one point in Bosnia wars you had three sides that were killing each other, like whoever gets to whom first, and you have Kosovo war, this is also war in defense that happened uh, at the end of the 90s in 1999, and some of the important events that history remember and that never will uh, uh, go into detail are Siege of Sarajevo, Battle of Vukovar, Genocide in Srebrenica, Operation Flesh and Storm, I forget, and NATO bombing of uh, what was back then Yugoslavia because of Kosovo War. Okay, before I start, I will show you the strongest picture that went around the world when war started. We managed to play it.
which means that I will insert them. Four stories that I will use to try to explain what actually happened and afterwards what is the situation today. Vukova has been a multi-ethnic city until the war, where more than 23 different ethnic groups lived, including most numerous Croats and Serbs. The city was really economically powerful. It was the second by economic power in the former Yugoslavia because it was a really big uh, harbor there in Yugoslavia. After three months siege of the city, it is hard to tell that something left, left out of the city, as you can see. It was completely destroyed and became a symbol of Croatian independence war. After Serbs took over the city, mass killings also happened. The biggest tragedy was killing 250 victims from Vukovar Hospital, which were buried in a farm called Ovchara, close to Vukovar city. Today, that place is the biggest commemor commemorative place in Croatia. The war ended, People slowly returned to their homes, but this evil spirit still remained about us and them and those others. And who are the others living next to you and what have they been doing during the war? Because actually it happened that people who were molesting, raping, killing over Vukovar lived houses next to each other after, after the war and nobody prosecuted them. However, uh, young people appear that they are trying to see a wider picture nowadays. Hopefully, we'll see soon in Vukovar that uh, in the end, it turns out that young Croats and Serbs are having the same problem, which is a huge unemployment and economical situation that actually moves them again from their own city because they just can't find a job. Second city is Knin. It is a place where uh, Serbian rebellion, uh, Serbian mi minority rebellion started. If you remember the map that Radovan showed, that is a place where before the war more than 80% of citizens were Serbs. And uh, rebellion started after Croatia declared an independence war back in uh, independence from Yugoslavia back in 1991. Uh, the city was under Serbian control until August 95, when it was liberated in the Operation Storm. Liberation of Knin is a symbol of Croatian victory, and it is celebrated as a national holiday every year on 5th of August. However, during Operation Storm, around 200,000 Serbs flee from Knin and Knin's area, and that was actually a term of ethnic cleansing that Radovan explained you in the beginning. They moved to Serbia and to Bosnia and Herzegovina in parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina that were controlled by Serbs. And after war, some Serbs returned to Croatia. And today, around 20 to 25% of them are living in the area around Knin. But comparing to more than 80% before war, it is really like minor number. As I already say, said, the same day that Croatia is celebrating as the biggest victory, uh, Serbs are commemorating as a tragedy for 200,000 people that flee from that area. And uh, when it comes to reconciliation, both political elites from Serbian and Croatian part are always a part of those celebration and commemoration and inflammatory narrative is visible every single year from both sides, especially if it's an elective year, then it just gets Sarajevo. The siege of Sarajevo was the siege of capital of Bosnia, and it was the longest capital city siege in the history of modern warfare. Um, Sarajevo was besieged by the Army of Republika Srpska from 92 to 96, 1,425 days during the Bosnian War. It lasted three times longer than the Battle of Stalingrad and more than a year longer than the siege of Leningrad. Although the city has been a model for inter-ethnic relations, war brought them dramatic population shifts. In addition to thousands of refugees who left the city, 
mainly Sarajevo Serbs left to the Republika Srpska, and percentage of Serbs in Sarajevo decreased from more than 30% in 91 to slightly over 10% in 2002. Nowadays, we can say that there are also two Sarajevos, Sarajevo and uh, Istočan Sarajevo, where mostly Serb, Bosnian Serbs are living. This picture, the last one, is one of the saddest stories happened in Sarajevo. It was a story about Sarajevo's Romy and Juliet. Story about Admira and Boško. They were 25 year and 24 year old couple. And they were killed by sniper bullet in no man's land on the Vrbanja bridge. They were childhood sweethearts and they their body bodies were left like this for seven days because nobody wanted to come to pick them up. This picture and the story went all over the world to show how tragic and pointless war was. She was a Muslim and he was a Serb. And when they finally took their bodies away, uh, it was a problem where to bury them. And finally they figure out, their families figure out how to lay them together. 8,372 victims. Genocide in Srebrenica is the only act of genocide and the greatest war crime in Europe after Second World War. It was recognized like that in European Parliament and by the court of ICT1. Srebrenica is a place where uh, killings of Bosnian Muslims were is conducted by Bosnian Serbs. There were three 36,000 people before war, 27,000 of them were Bosniak. 13,000 people live there nowadays, and it's like half and half more or less, but those people literally can stand each other. Still 8,372 victims every July. There is a huge commemoration happening in Srebrenica. What is one of the, mo the biggest problems is that uh, in spite of uh, verdict from ICTY, uh, Serbs from Republika Srpska, uh, are, they established a commission to probe wartime crimes in Srebrenica, and that will never help, help to achieve the truth and reconciliation. They are basically more or less neglecting verdict and what happened there. Yeah, I'll just run you to some of the most uh, some of the most famous photos that, came, photos that came from war. Some of them you can see even in museum in DC if they didn't close it already. Uh, this one is by Ron Khabib, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's a Serbian soldier kicking like corpse of a dead woman. Like this photo is still relevant because lately, maybe three years ago, they, someone published an article that this guy was never convicted and he's a DJ in the grade currently. So this like really uh, doesn't help reconciliation. This is one of the uh, scenes from uh, uh, Siege of Sarajevo. This is one of the concentration camps uh, and, and prisoners. This one is the only one positive, I think. Uh, this is the lady uh, who, like, it was still siege, it was still uh, danger, the sniper bullet. She decided to put on her, on her best clothes because she couldn't stay in her home. She later became a face of some fashion campaign. And this was one of the rare positive images that, that came from the war. This is one of the paramilitary leaders from Serbia. His uh, group was called the White Tigers. This is the White Tiger that he kind of took from the Belgrade Zoo. And this is the most famous uh, photo from the Kosovo War. Uh, at, at, at some point in the war, uh, they pushed uh, Albanians from Kosovo to the border of Albania, so they were exchanging children and, and, uh, and others, and they would return, and uh, the rest of the things happen. And we're now yeah, talking about Bosnia, yeah. So we, we took two examples, just to show you some other things. We are now in, 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 in current time after the war, that some of these countries have some systemic errors uh, in the way how they were made, like by their founders and by international community, that that really doesn't help to reconciliation. So this is a picture of two Mostars. 
one during the war and the other nowadays. Uh, Mostar is the capital of Herzegovina with the, within a part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it's really popular location for tourists nowadays. Uh, thousands of people are coming to the city to see the old bridge, a masterpiece of 16th century Ottoman architecture and also protected as a UNESCO heritage, world heritage. There is nothing to indicate, as you can see in this right picture, that one riverbank is Muslim and the other riverbank is Croat. But the truth is different. Mostar is nicknamed as Grad Slučaj. If we translate that, it will be a case of a city also known as the divide city, the city of hatred, the city where violence erupts anytime, and the city with no reconciliation. The bridge that connects to riverbanks still makes the biggest division between Muslims and Croats. It is still not that rare to hear that people are feeling anxious or scared or uncomfortable of what might happen if they just go to the other side of a bridge where the others live. There is a dividing line that exists in the hearts and minds of people in Mostar. In Mostar. It corresponds to the front line that ran through the city center up to the high school. Why am I mentioning this high school? Because in 2003, after war, they finally united two high schools. One was Krat and the other was Muslim. And from the outside, it looked as a perfect scenario. Finally, Muslims and Croats going to school together. But truth is like really different. Uh, they were in the same building, but they were taking separate classes. They were having separate professor, separate courses, separate curriculums. It turned out that the only place where they are meeting are literally school toys. In a reality, Bosnia remains a really fractured society, and it seems that it was easier to rebuild a bridge from, from 16th century that was completely destroyed, that is going to be a rebuilt a society in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And why is it like this? Try to check it. This, uh, I mean, I don't expect you to read this. Just Look how does it look like. <laughs> this is the world's most complicated system of a government. Trust me. <laughs> since I don't have five hours to yeah. explain you right now because to be honest, I'm not even sure how does it function. You can see. Imagine you live in Bosnia and Herzegovina and you're one of the 46% unemployed young people who desperately wants to change something. They always tell you the best way to make a difference is to vote. So you walk in, and they give you this. Probably the longest ballot ever. And you need it, because this is a country with 14 separate parliaments, five presidents, hundreds of representatives, and not to mention 136 appointed ministers. It is probably one of the most used words in the country. This is complicated, so bear with me. There are two administrative units formed after the four-year war in the early 1990s. One is called the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, made up mainly of Bosniaks and Croats. The other is Republic of Serbia, made up mainly of Serbs. Each entity has their own presidents, vice presidents, prime ministers, parliaments, and ministers. And that would be it. Unless you live in entity Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, that has cantons. Administrative units made so that there are some areas where Croats and Bosniaks are a majority. Who invented all this? Well, it was the international community. During the Dayton Peace Agreement, which ended the 1992-1995 war, they wrote a constitution trying to satisfy the party side of the conflict. The war ended, but the country suffers from poverty and corruption, and probably the most complicated system of government in Simple, huh? <laughs> uh, the, the Dayton Peace Agreement is supposed to last just like five years until things are settled up in Bosnia. 
Bosnia is still living under Dayton Agreement. And it is just like super complicated situation that basically there are three nations and two entities and one can always block all government and make a system shutdown if they just don't appear on a meeting of uh, council of ministers of the parliament because everything is divided in three and if one part doesn't show up the other two can't do anything I, I'm sorry that we didn't uh, bring you to show up, right? but Alma knows it is so entrenched, these three people in Bosnia, that you see that we all speak, probably here, that we all speak same language, that if you buy a pack, pack of cigarettes in Bosnia, you will have, we need to buy law to say that smoking is hurting your health, you will have this in three times written in Bosnian, Bosniak, Serbian, and Croatian, but it's the same words, and it's the same language, but they still insist to write it three times so they will all have their, their language. And we, now, can, we can show you the photo. And now that. just bear in mind, it's just a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Now try to imagine all government, all every single office of public affair, printing all the documents. And translating. And translating in three languages. So Kosovo is uh, another story. Uh, we didn't mention it before, just that shortly as I can. Kosovo wanted independence, Serbia didn't want to give them, they formed a liberation army, Serbia uh, came in hard to do some war crimes, uh, NATO stepped up, they start bombing what was then Serbia and Montenegro, and then uh, Serbia goes uh, uh, back uh, from Kosovo, and at some point Kosovo unilaterally declares independence. Yeah, and at that moment when they unilaterally declare independence, I think they had a bit of problem, because they asked the European Union, should we do this? A European Union said, no, no, you should just wait because all countries in Europe would not recognize you because they have their own problems like Spain with Basquia and Catalonia. So you should just wait so we can figure it out. So they go to Americans and they say, should we do this? And say, go for it. And that's why you have the, like a boulevard of Bill Clinton in Kosovo today. But And then European Union comes in and Kosovo makes a really good uh, uh, at that moment, success on the foreign uh, uh, on, in diplomacy, they get a lot of countries uh, recognize that these are the countries that uh, that recognize them, the, the green ones. But still, a lot of countries don't recognize them. And Serbia, like last five years, has been doing like extreme diplomatic activities on countries who recognize them to revoke the recognition. <laughs> and these are usually the countries like small countries of a couple of thousands of people in the islands that don't know where is Serbia, where is Kosovo or something, but they managed to do it. And you have crazy situation in Serbia. There's a restaurant that offers specialty from a country that didn't recognize Kosovo, for example. And uh, it's more serious than that. Serbia do also don't want Kosovo to enter uh, into some, uh, to become member of some international organizations like Interpol. So they block, uh, block them from entering then Kosovo gets an angry. Last time they got angry, they impose a tariff of 100% of all products from Serbia, which is crazy because they are so close. They import a lot of stuff uh, from Serbia. And then there was international pressures to re revoke those tariffs, which they did in the end, but really, really highly. It should supposed to work under something we call the Brussels Agreement, which was kind of agreement between Kosovo and Serbia that they will try to work it out, that Serbia don't need to recognize them, but they will work it out, but it doesn't work. Uh, Kosovo never gave rights to the Serbs still, still living in Kosovo. Serbs, as you can see here, don't recognize Kosovo institutions. This is a bit different because uh, lately they are participating in, in, in elections, but they still, and you have Mitrovica, which is like most of is divided, but you can walk the bridge and hopefully nothing will happen. Mitrovica is divided, you don't walk the bridge. Like there's a barricade on the bridge, nobody walks the bridge. This is the last and the only divided uh, uh, city in Europe. And then there is this idea, which is exchange of territories. And this can be floated a bit, like a bit shy. So uh, this is Kosovo. This is part of Kosovo where uh, most of the people are Serbians. This is Serbia, this is part of Serbia where the most of people are Albanians. 
and current president of Serbia, uh, Alexander Vucic, had this idea to exchange territories. A lot of people in former uh, prime minister of Kosovo, they know that a lot of people is against it. European Union is against it. A lot of Kosovo and Serbian people is against it because changing of the borders in the Balkans and resettling people is never a good option. But it looks something that they are still pushing. And lately, like one year ago, uh, US become again really interested in, in uh, Balkans because the current president is uh, big on making deals. So he wants to make a deal also here and to have a, a victory in foreign policy. He will obviously not have a victory in this Kushner's plan for, for Middle East, but here he appointed two special envoys. One is Matthew Palmer, uh, officially appointed by the State Department. One is uh, Richard Grenell, who is uh, supposedly even uh, should uh, become uh, uh, someone in charge of uh, security intelligence agencies. And uh, according to insiders, they are also floating this idea of, of exchanging territories. But this, it, it's going to be really hard for this to go smoothly because even people like there is, this is majority Albanian, but a lot of people are here are Serbian and they are openly saying, we don't want to uh, just wake up one day in Albania, in, in Kosovo. Uh, and like without huge support from people and from European Union, which is now uh, for them is a bit hard to deal with, with all this uh, uh, revoked US influence. Uh, it's going to be a problem again. And Kosovo, I, I mentioned Kosovo because for like for all these countries, uh, it's going to be maybe uh, able to do some reconciliation for Kosovo. It's going to be really hard because Serbs that currently live in Kosovo are basically living in enclaves. They are completely separated. Every time a police come uh, from uh, a, a Kosovo, police come to arrest some of them. It's a huge scandal, then rhetoric goes crazy, especially if it's before elections and uh, things get crazy. And for Kosovo, it's gonna be really hard to do reconciliation. There, there are basically two reconciliation. One is reconciliation between states, which is kind of easier because you need to like uh, do some negotiations to be good in the economy and like to trade, but reconciliation within states where you have still different ethnic groups and different religious groups, it's gonna be much harder. Just to show you something like in, in Bosnia, uh, they can show that in 1991, just before uh, war started, there was 36% of mixed marriages. This is like huge number compared even anywhere to the world because this usually doesn't happen in, in, in this number. And then this is like current, not current, maybe five years ago. This is uh, when you ask uh, uh, Bosnian Muslims, would they marry? They would say 30 of them would marry a uh, Croat, uh, six of them would marry Roma people, and 11% uh, of them would marry Serbs. 70% of Serbs would not marry Albanian. And this is also crazy. We, as a Montenegro, we were not officially in the war. There was never war on territory of Montenegro, so we can't, didn't suffer all of this. But in a recent uh, you know, poll, 47% of Montenegrin students, so this should be the most progressive group in the country, said they would not marry someone of the different religion just shows you how strong was this rhetoric of intra-religious and intra-ethnic conflict and it left mark even on the countries that weren't directly involved in the war, that didn't see their, their cousin die on the street. And then we have EU, which is like the most important international factor here, and they're all also trying to push for reconciliation, how they do it, they do it uh, through sticking carrot approach, so they say if you do reconciliation, we're gonna give you funds. We're gonna uh, we're gonna progress in, uh, in in this process because all of these countries are uh, trying to become members of the EU. Gonna progress in this process of becoming EU member. If you don't do it, we're gonna stop negotiations with, with you. It's gonna be really hard to uh, to become a member of the EU. And they say things like this: all countries must uh, commit, word uh, word and deed. And they say uh, reconciliation cannot be imposed from the outside. The leaders of the region must take full ownership and lead by example. They know after so many, after so many examples that if you push reconciliation from the top, this will not be the real one. You need to do it on the grassroots level. People need to realize 
that they need to cooperate with each other. And this is one really important thing uh, regarding conciliation. This is International uh, Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, or as we know it, HAG, because it, it happened in, uh, in the HAG in, in Netherlands. And, and uh, it was a huge thing. It, it accomplished so many things. It uh, sentenced some people to, to life sentences to 30 years, 40 years. It's a million of documents, but it has still the mixed, mixed result because some of these people who were accused or who even died there become martyrs, become national heroes. Serbs always think, Serbs always think that they were really misjudged in this because Croats and Albanians were, uh, were released and only Serbs were, were convicted. And I'll show you this and Eva could, could maybe talk about it because she was working on this while it happened on live television. Stop, please. Uh, please sit down. Ah. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen this. He killed himself. He drank cyanide. Yeah. Oh my God. yeah. That was one of the last verdicts of ICTY. He was uh, accused with, in a case Perlic and Ostali for uh, war crimes in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and it, it, he has a really interesting life story. I mean, he uh, graduated uh, drama and theater and political sciences and scenography. He had like three or four degrees, super yeah. educated person. And then he became one of the generals in the Hrvatsko Obrane, which was a part of Croatian army in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And actually, one of the things he was accused of is uh, destroying the Mostar bridge, the old one, 16th century bridge in uh, Mostar. Actually, in the end, it, it was never proved whether Croatian or, uh, Bosni or Bosniaks destroyed bridge. It was like really complicated. They had various videos. I really wouldn't answer now in that yeah. he was guilty because literally no, I, like, no one knows. But and even court told that if they destroy it, like if Croatian army destroyed it, that it can be considered as a military object, although this is a 16th century bridge, yeah. stone bridge that used just people to cross and bring food and medicines mm -hmm. from one side of the city to the other. So yeah. What he said, he said, I don't recognize the I don't recognize and yeah, this court told, and decision. So his last yeah. words were Pralak is not a war criminal. I don't recognize the jurisdiction of this court. And he drank and signed it. Signed it and this and was he... the last verdict of this court. After this, it closed because they, uh, they, they finished their work. But it led them with this image, the guy killing himself. And, and just on... to explain your context, so this is broadcasted in Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia. All national televisions or news channels Everyone is broadcasting live feeds that ICTY gives. Usually, if ICTY has even a notion that something is going to be tricky or it can be like suspicious or dangerous, they do a live broadcast with a, like a three to five minutes of delay. Mm -hmm. So, in case something happens, they will just cut it off. This wasn't the case. It was live transmitted. He said the sentences and drank cyanide. And actually, it took like thir judge was yeah. staring like this 30, 40 seconds because he wasn't aware that what what happened. Like he drank something, but he's still like sitting and nothing is going on. And when he actually started to get a seizure because he was dying from cyanide, judge told put the curtains down and then just image went to black. And then all of us, after like 25 minutes, when there was first information starting to come from a court courtroom that he died, realized that we were live broadcasting suicide. What year was it? For years? 2017. 2017. Or 16, years ago. Yeah, 17, yeah. And this is uh, other famous case. This is a leader of uh, Bosnian Serbs who was hiding from justice almost 15 years, 
And when they came, when they arrested him, finally, uh, this was him. He was actually not hiding. He was even appearing on television, going to Croatia for summer. For summer vacation. He was doing some like, like uh, guru, guru, life, life, guru life coaching, coaching yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah, it, but it shows you that Serbian intelligence was never actually committed to like uh, arresting him because they obviously knew where he is. We had the same situation yeah. with Ante Gotovina that was one of the most famous Croatian generals. He was arrested in the Tenerife in a high class, high class restaurant and they just came and picked him up. I mean, and he was hiding for 10 years or a bit less. And our negotiations with European Union were stopped because of it. And then all of a sudden he just showed up in a two star Michelin restaurant yeah. in Tenerife. And this is like a really, these guys actually psychologists and before the war, he wrote poems for kids and then he became one of the most known war criminals in the world. Uh, yeah, I will make it short. Up, yeah. yeah, we will speed up. So uh, as Radovan already mentioned, there is a European Union that uh, starts to, tries to use reconciliation also as a part of negotiations. For instance, when Croatia was entering to European Union, when we were negotiating, there was a special chapter about uh, reconciliation rights of minorities and the prosecution of all war crimes. Uh, there are also self, like lots of NGOs. For instance, in Croatia, we have a Documenta. Documenta is a center for facing with, uh, with the past. It is, a, it is a non governmental organization that encourages the process of dealing with the past within Croatia and establishing the uh, factual truth about the war. So not only this narrative how Croatia was leading a victorious war for independence, but making an awareness that Croatian soldiers also committed war crimes during the war. There is also a RECOM. A RECOM stands for Regional Commission task with establishing the facts about all victims of, of the war crimes and other serious human rights violations committed on the territory of former Yugoslavia. And uh, we can also mention uh, RICO, which is a part of partly European Union funded. Uh, it's uh, about youth and reconciliation. And what happens when the national politics involve in reconciliation? Um, this is a uh, Bukovar and this is one of the tables like usually you have a science in front of a public of public affair offices this was a police police station but usually we have it in in front of like every single institution um dozens of current war veterans protested in a hookah against signs that were written in bold letters latin and cyrillic what happens is that according to Croatian law, if there is a minority that has more than 30% citizens, they have a right to have their own letters and their own language written in the names of streets, in names of institutions. But in Bukovar, that was a huge problem because being a sign of city Bukova written in Cyrillic meant that those others arrived again and because of mostly because of the bad uh, and not prepared uh, national narrative in the end this happened the situation escalated and war veterans literally destroyed these tables around the city. And how long this will take? Uh, young people are connecting through music, sports, social media, schools. And actually, uh, according to the latest uh, research, 70% of young people believe in reconciliation. But as you can see, three factors they consider to be a problem within a reconciliation are media, education, and politics. 
Yeah, uh, we, we, we like to finish on a positive note because we <laughs> like <laughs> we get a lot of negative stuff, and actually it's not that negative because we have really broad cultural cooperation. This is famous uh, uh, Serbian singer, probably the most famous in back in Yugoslavia. This is Croatian, uh, like a big arena. Oh, it's full. He's coming to Phoenix. If you want to see, see him, like in, in, in next month. Uh, there's like economic cooperation, super important because these countries really develop on uh, uh, trade exchange between each other. That makes them uh, all better. There is a couple of initiatives, uh, regional that try to foster that. Tourism is becoming increasingly important. Croats now want Serbs to, to come to their seaside. There's still a bit of, you know, uh, people are scared of the incidents that happened and then they like emphasize in the media of someone uh, destroying your car because they see the license plates from, from, from Serbia, but it's getting better. And it's honoring good examples, which I think it's really important. This is the street of Sergen Alexic. Sergen Alexic was a Serb, 24 years old. Uh, in Trebinje, they attacked his friend, uh, Serbian army attacked his friend, called Muslims, he defended him and they killed him. And now a lot of uh, cities across Serbia and Montenegro and Bosnia, but not his hometown somehow, uh, he's having a street name after him. There's a really good f uh, uh, film uh, uh, about him. Uh, I can recommend it to you uh, later. So honoring of these good examples are uh, super important. I forgot sports. Sports is kind of divisive because we have such a good examples. We have Serbian champion uh, in tennis, Novak Djokovic, saying that he actually cheers for the uh, Croat uh, national sport in football. They say that they cheer for him. We have a Croat uh, uh, Croatian team squad uh, uh, supporting the Serbian minority leader in, in, in Croatia. But for all of these good things, you have bad things, you have football hooligans, you have... So four days ago, there was a news that the first Serb ever would play for the Kosovo uh, uh, national sport in soccer. Two days ago, there was a news that both his mother and father were fired from Serbian companies because he said that he will play for uh, uh, for Kosovo soccer team. So sport is usually divisive, but it can bring people together. And we would like really to finish on a positive note because in my opinion, like the biggest obstacle are the election cycle because you need the enemy and the easiest enemy for every politician is the enemy of different religion or different ethnicity. And then in order to like, to strengthen their base, to, to uh, solidify, they just say, you know, if we lose, Serbs or Croats or Bosnians are going to come over and it's going to be a uh, 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 war again. And this is, I think, the biggest obstacle uh, in reconciliation in the Balkans. Thank you. In some ways, it almost feels strange to clap after a presentation like this. Yeah. Um, but I would do applaud the intelligence, the knowledge, the insights, um, having been on the streets of Sarajevo where that market happened. Be before that, please yeah, come to see a uh, really great documentary about uh, refugee, uh, refugees that our uh, fellow Ang was uh, making, uh, uh, participating uh, in it. It's on Tuesday at 6.30 in Persa Metropolitan. Okay, so let's switch back to the Balkans for a final few minutes with some questions. Who's got the first one? Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask about the practice of journalism. Uh, in these new countries, are journalists free to report without fear and favor? Or do governments try to censor them? Or do they self-censor because they're afraid? Different examples now that can okay, talk this, about curse. This is, this is off the record. Um, <laughs> I'm executive producer of, on, a, <laughs> on a news channel that covers Bosnia, Croatia, and uh, Serbia. Mm -hmm. it's, it is N1. And Basically, we are trying to do our best to be independent, but yeah, there are some influences. It happened in Croatia, it happened in Serbia, it happened in Bosnia. I think so at this point of time, Serbia is facing the biggest challenge. Uh, President Vucic is basically uh, trying to impose the same scenario that happened in Hungary and 
what Orban did with the free media, mm -hmm. and what is really um, so when Croatia was entering the European Union, uh, there were really really strong pressures about media freedoms, and actually we had, I mean, to be honest. We have a lot of pressures now in Croatia as well, but it will never happen that outlet is going to be shut down, that somebody is going to attack journalists, mm -hmm. that you will lose your job. I mean, except of the public service broadcaster where public service broadcaster is suing their own journalists. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And, um, but European Union was trying to push Croatia hard in order to gain media freedom. With Serbia, there is a, such a huge problem with Kosovo that somehow, sometimes it happens that you just have a feeling that somebody is keeping an eye closed for one thing yeah. in mm -hmm. order to negotiate the other thing, which is like for them more important for democracy. I'm not so sure. Yeah. It's different in different countries. In Serbia, basically, the uh, ruling party, the president controls, um, I would say, most of the media, all TV stations, not all newspapers. Mm -hmm controls and he tried to push the one that critiques him like outside of the system like, so my, like within my the, the channel, television. at the moment uh, there is a public uh, actually state cable uh, provider mm -hmm. and we are shut down from the state cable yeah. provider six mm -hmm. months before elections yeah in montenegro you can publish whatever you want whenever you want but government uh government uh, gives unfair advantage, usually financial, to the media that supports them and that media self-censorship is like the editorial policy. In Croatia you would be offended, like insulted by politicians, they are going to try to discredit you, be super rude towards you, they will even sue you for, uh, according to liability law. But Croatia but, is far the best. But we are far the best from all the countries. Next question. Frank. Uh, thank you. Uh, and wow, you know, sort of shocking to receive that, that snapshot. Um, so can you talk about the, the role or presence of advocacy journalism? I mean, I mean, journalists are not just reporting news, they're experiencing it. How is, is there an advocacy component to journalism where within journalism there are efforts to promote reconciliation versus merely report on the divisions, as you know, you know, the political cycles where there's this fraction. Uh, are there active efforts at, at within the journalism community at trying to push the positive uh, movement toward reconciliation? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, in most of the countries, most of the media that is, I would say, not too much polarized, there is this thing. They there like we don't have like First Amendment. If you promote discrimination, hate speech, you get arrested by, uh, according to the law. And they don't. They tend not to. But you have, especially in Serbia, awful, awful political tabloids who are warmongering on a daily basis, publishing fake news, misinformation, whatever. And they're more influential than the media who, who would advocate for reconciliation, I would, I would say. Because less educated people would prefer to read scandalous news about war is coming again, than about, let's see the results of the European Commission for Reconciliation and the three workshops that they did, that they gathered three people from three different states into one room and so they had a nice talk. Yeah, that, that war, war is coming is always sells more and people read more. And for instance, when it comes to my new channel, since we are, as I said, operating regionally, it is interesting to see when it comes to uh, commemoration of uh, Croatian victory, of Knin, of uh, Vukovar, of Srebrenica. Uh, it would never happen before that somebody is broadcasting. I mean, we are not obliged to broadcast, so we are three production centers that can mm -hmm. operate together. But usually we produce like around 80, 85% of our program on our own. But we are still broadcasting each other's like big, big historical events like Srebrenica is, it was 
first year last or the, the year before that it was broadcasted on Serbian uh, wow. platform as well. And mm. I mean, they were really criticized by the establishment, but we did it. Uh, Serbian president didn't want ingenious things. He always, on most of the uh, issues, pushed his tabloids to give the most polarized, craziest uh, thing. And then he appears as a more moderate. And everyone knows that he is the one instructing this, but in the face of the international community, so you know what people are thinking, but I'm not, I'm moderate, let's do it, let's do it this way. And it works, it actually works for him. One more question, I think we've got, who's got it out there? Yes, sir. Well, so you talked about um, uh, what happened and uh, that the efforts of re reconciliation, what's your prediction as to whether or not reconciliation will work or is there another war in the Balkans to be political? A question of million uh, dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are always scared by the prospect of another war. But, and there is only two, two cases where another war could happen. Like Bosnia is still a country that is dysfunctional. And the Republic of Serbska yeah. is always threatening that they are going to divorce from yeah. Herzegovina. Although I don't, think it, I don't think it, uh, it will ever be in, no, sh in short, sure. in yeah. short uh, or mid like future, but it's going to be huge political problems with uh, status of uh, Republika Srpska, which is a Serbian entity in, in Bosnia. And if this exchange of territories in Kosovo happens, this will not go smoothly. But yeah, I, I hopefully think, think this is going to be. I agree happen. with Kosovo, yeah. but when it comes to reconciliation, uh, I think so. The one of the biggest issues is economy, economical situation in all of the countries, and youth unemployment, because like when you young people are employed and they have perspective, they are not going to turn towards a nationalist and polarizing parts. They will like work and provide for their life, and they are going to be more or less happy. And then you actually have a, more opportunities to like work within other groups and reconciliate and practice them like this with 30% of unemployment. Well, but it's so easy to turn, like in Montenegro, which I said didn't have war and it's in terrible economic position. We have now the biggest protest that country have seen and people are bickering whether they are Serbs or Montenegrins. Although these countries never went to war, but they found something like 100 years ago where Serbia kind of occupy Montenegro. And this is the main political issue today in Montenegro. What happened 100 years ago, which did Serbia actually occupy? Is our church, is their church, is our church? And uh, youth unemployment over 40%, uh, public debt over 70%. Yeah, and, but this is, the, this is the thing that energizes people. That's why reconciliation is it, so hard. And when it comes to reconciliation in Croatia, we are still trying to reconciliate with borders. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. We didn't enter in okay. 90s for serious. No, really, because like mm -hmm. one of the biggest discussions is who was a part of Nazi puppet state, who was a part of it. So by the time we get to the 90s, it will take a while. I know, Alma, lots of folks want to continue <laughs> this dialogue, so we're going to let that happen if we let you go. But one thing we didn't get, how old were you during the war? When war started, so, <laughs> okay, this, this is like the craziest story of <laughs> When war started, I will tell you, yeah, I will share this. When war started, I was like four years old, three and a half. And uh, my father is a history teacher. And he knew that there is going to be a lot of polarized talks, narr like narrative, war narratives within our apartment house. Various people will be coming to our house, discuss about war. So I was never allowed to watch any single news bulletin <laughs> while I was a kid. We, what was happening at the same time as the news bulletin was a cartoons on Italian television because I'm from coastal part, so we could watch Italian television. And I was like super persistent to watch cartoons, but we didn't have money in the middle of a war to buy two television. So my father told me that once the war is over, there is not going to be newscast anymore. <laughs> and on the 5th of August, 1995, when Knin was liberated, and flag is rising. He called me like, come from your room. You have to see this. This is a moment of history. And I started to run and jump around the house, screaming that finally no more in the sky. 
Today I'm executive producer of a new show. How old were you? Yeah, we're, we were both. We were born. We were four yeah. when the war started, and I remember that the only reliable source that we could hear in Montenegro was Radio Free, Free Europe. Yeah. But yeah, and it's really sad that today Radio Free Europe and Voice of America are not even popular, not having any substance because, yeah. All right. Thank you all for coming. Continue the dialogue. Alex, an expert, of course, is from Bosnia. If you've got more questions, you could ask her as well. Thank you all. Thank you for coming all of this February. Uh, fabulous February. Yeah. Cool. All right. The movie? So, oh, yeah. Where? 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 Uh, Where? On the second yeah. page. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, I'll see you later. i